So we're going to move on to the world of unsupervised learning. So it's kind of like the poor and ugly brother of uh, supervised learning these days. Um, because most of the very impressive results on competitions and, and benchmarks and so forth have been uh, done with just purely supervised methods on pretty large um, data sets. So we're seeing applications like object recognition, that's definitely the most popular. Um, though we're seeing things like pose estimation, they're very uh, competitive pose estimation techniques. Uh, Video-based activity recognition, um, which I was going to talk about 3D convenance, but I just didn't think we have time. But you can extend conv convolutional nets from 2D filters to 3D filters and, and model temporal data that way. Um, so I think even though progress in this field has been slower and there's much fewer groups working in this area, unsupervised learning is very important still to deep learning. And the idea that is very attractive, right? You can take some data and auto automatically do some feature discovery and learn these representations that are useful for doing higher level reasoning without having to put human engineering into the problem. So um, let's talk about unsupervised learning. So I want to start this by talking about a, an interesting historical fact, which is that, as I mentioned very briefly earlier, it was actually unsupervised learning that got the whole deep learning craze off uh, and going in around 2006. So um, I, I mentioned, I'm going to talk about these models in detail, but this is a stacking of an unsupervised module called the restricted Boltzmann machine. So you're training a one layer network, then you're taking the data produced by this network and training another network on top of it, and then you're joining it together into a deep network. And people found that when you join these networks this way and then fine tune them using supervised learning, they were actually um, easier to optimize and, and perform very well. So this got people excited right around 2006. But then GPUs came along and bigger data sets came along and people just started using supervised learning to train big confidence and they did really well. So like I said, um, all of these things have made supervised learning work well, but we should still keep in mind uh, and, 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 uh, and I think also, uh, for those of you who are interested in this, research in unsupervised learning methods is, is very exciting and relevant. So let's just give a few reasons why we might want to use unsupervised learning. So you see examples like YouTube, Flickr, Google Glass, all these are huge repositories of data. Right? So we're generating data at a, at a massive rate. A lot of this data is available free. Right? We don't have the humans go out and, and label it if we can just use the data that's unlabeled. So um, the idea behind using unsupervised learning to exploit labeled data is that we might be able to uh, do something with it that might even help a supervised task. Okay? The other um, reason why unsupervised learning is interesting is that we can actually ask new questions. Okay, So the idea behind supervised learning is we learn features that are specific for a, a task. right? So we learn a comm net to do object recognition. Once we've trained that model, it can only do object recognition. That's what it's been trained to do. right? When we do unsupervised learning, we have a model that produces a representation that could be used for other tasks. So it's more generic. So this is a picture of some features from a five-layer model that's been trained uh, a, a convolutional net, okay, and using a technique of visualization uh, that was in a paper at the end of last year. Um, and this is showing the filters that have been discovered. Um, note that these filters are not as nice looking as the ones I showed you before that were trained with unsupervised learning. These filters have been trained to do recognition. Okay, So they're specifically, you know, they, they've learned these particular patterns, these, these filter banks have been learned to be good at recognizing objects, generic objects from a specific data set. Okay, so the third reason why unsupervised learning might be interesting is that it's been shown to be a good regularizer for supervised learning. I haven't talked a lot about regularization, but it's always a good idea to use regularization, uh, particularly in um, supervised learning methods. And so this, is, this idea has shown up in transfer learning, in domain adaptation, uh, with unbalanced classes, and the idea of zero-shot learning. So um, zero-shot or one-shot learning, the idea that you could do unsupervised learning to learn some parameters or features and then do a single pass with a single example to update that network to be able to recognize that example. Okay, so this is an interesting study done um, two years ago out of the Montreal group. They visualized 
neural networks in, in a two-dimensional uh, manifold embedding. Um, so this is basically, uh, the simple way to think about this is taking a neural net, running it through a data set, and collecting the outputs for all the examples in that data set, taking that big vector of outputs, and then mapping that to a low-dimensional representation. And that creates a low-dimensional or two-dimensional representation of that network, of that function approximator. Okay, so we look at um, going from blue to green is training of that network. Okay, so it's evolving the network as we uh, look at data and process it um, from you know, start of training to several epochs of training. Without pre-training, you'll see that the networks um, are initialized somewhere uh, and then they, they evolve through time and they actually um, are quite different than one another in terms of where they end up. So this is using different random initializations of the parameters. On the other hand, if we do pre-training, so we do some unsupervised learning to initialize the parameters of those networks, and then we do supervised learning after that, we see that they take a very different trajectory. Okay, So we actually see that going from blue at the beginning of training to green, they actually all go towards the same point. Okay, So the idea here is sort of um, gaining robustness to different initializations to the network. All right, so um, the other idea behind uh, using unsupervised learning is the idea of level local training signals. So we talked about backpropagation and doing credit assignments. So in backpropagation, we do a, you know, a forward pass through the network, we compute some error, and then we have to do credit assignment of that error through backpropagation uh, to the various parameters in that network. And we have problems of vanishing gradients and so forth that we talked about already. Um, there's different issues that come up with propagating this credit back through a supervised learning approach. If we focus on just training layers at a time, this is actually not subject to all these problems like vanishing gradients. Okay? So um, it's also thought to be actually more biologically plausible to do sort of level local training signals as well. So typically unsupervised learning approaches exploit this sort of local, uh, local learning. Um, that's not to say we don't want to be able to train unsupervised learning modules that are deep, so the whole model at, 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 at the same time. Um, but typically this is what's been done. Um, and then finally, we've talked a lot about simple problems like classification uh, or regression. Simple in the fact that the outputs that they produce are, say, one of k categories or a single number or so forth. But there are a lot of problems that fall under the umbrella of what's called structured output prediction, where you're actually predicting a high dimensional output. So you take an image in, and say you produce an image out. So this is something like segmentation, where you take an image and in and you produce a mask. Okay? Or you take an image and produce multiple attributes. The important part here is that we call this structured prediction because there's actually structure in this output. So the attributes may have relationships between one another and correlations here. Same with the segmentation, it's smooth, right? So the types of computations and the fact that you, might, might, you may need to consider sort of an, an exponentially large number of output configurations is related to the types of computations that are used in unsupervised learning. So there's parallels between unsupervised learning and, unstru and, and structured output problems. And as we move forward in these deep learning models, we're going to be tackling more and more structured output problems instead of just simple outputs. OK, so let's just do a quick review on what we've talked about and the types of features that we're generating. So the idea behind um, supervised learning is that we're learning a task-specific set of features. So we have some input, we pass it through a network, we generate a prediction, we take a target, this is the labels or the ground truth, we compute some error, and we update that function approximator that's represented by the, say, the neural network. Um, again, using Zeller and Fergus's uh, visualization approach, we can see by sort of masking parts of an image and then measuring the response of the output of a particular category, um, what parts of those image each feature is sensitive to. So we see that in this, this feature right here, it's sensitive when you mask out the face of the dog. Okay, and it turns out when you visualize that feature, it looks something like a Pomeranian face. Okay? Um, if you mask out this image and you see how the, the, the responses change in the output maps, you find that this is actually responding mostly to the text on the car. So this is a, essentially a text detection feature. 
Um, and in this one, essentially you're finding some responses on the faces of individuals. And you'll see it, looks mo it actually looks kind of like a woman's face. So this is kind of a, a face detection-like feature. So these are not low-level features. These are features um, uh, at layer five in this convolutional net. And these features are good for recognizing things like Pomeranians and car wheels and Afghan hounds. These are the, the classes out of a thousand classes that are in ImageNet. There's no guarantee that these are going to be um, better for other problems. Now, in unsupervised learning, we have the input. Our model can generate some prediction or some output, but we don't have a target anymore. Okay, so this makes it much more challenging to compute the error function because we don't really know what the error function should be. So what should be the objective um, for doing unsupervised learning? So this is one of the biggest challenges um, in unsupervised learning and people have proposed different objectives like reconstruction. So can you take the input, produce some feature representation of, of it, and then reconstruct to get the same uh, input at maximum fidelity? Um, you could use uh, essentially statistical type of objectives like doing maximum likelihood. Um, this is used for restricted Boltzmann machines. Um, and then also if you have extra information, so not necessarily labels but side information that comes with the data set, you could try to explicitly disentangle factors of variation. So this is an example of some work done by Hong at Klee's lab um, where they've specifically got features to disentangle the pose of a person and the person's an identity but they would need to have pose and identity information with that data. They can't do that with just purely unsupervised data. Okay, so that's the motivations, uh, the reasons why we might want to consider unsupervised learning. For the remainder of this talk, I'm going to talk about some methods. Okay, so specifically we're going to talk about autoencoders and restricted Boltzmann machines, which are the most popular and basic building blocks of deep uh, unsupervised learning approaches. Um, we're going to talk about you know, extending these into deeper models, and then we'll also talk a little bit about some practical issues. So, um, if any of you have followed Jeff Hinton's Coursera course on neural networks and machine learning online, uh, you'll see that when he talks about autoencoders, he, he introduces them from the point of view of PCA. And I think that's a good idea because a lot of people understand um, PCA. Who's here, who's here heard of PCA before? Okay, I was expecting to see lots of hands. Okay, good. So some of you are probably just sleepy and don't feel like putting your hand up. But I bet a lot of you have heard about PCA, right? So PCA is good for modeling data when it lies on a linear manifold in higher dimensional space, right? And so the idea of PCA and the way it's uh, typically used is people um, want to produce a lower dimensional representation of the data, so they extract the principal components and they only retain a few of the ones that have uh, the highest variance. Okay, so they take some data, um, say it's in uh, n dimensions, and we're going to pick m components. And essentially, what that means is we project the data on a lower dimensional subspace, and we throw away all the information that's orthogonal to this lower dimensional manifold. So, and this is a very simple two two D picture here, where we've essentially picked one direction or one principal component. Okay, and we project all of the points, all these black points, onto this component which means for this red point, it just gets projected onto this green point there, right? So all of the information in the direction orthogonal to the principal component, so in this direction here, that gets discarded. But typically that's okay for PCA because those are the directions of low variance. That's where the data is not really changing those directions. So it's typically um, from a squared error perspective, it's a reasonable thing to do. Now there are some limitations with PCA. Um, Namely that uh, you can't really capture nonlinear structure in the data. So if your data doesn't lie on a linear manifold in, uh, in, in some high dimensional space, then PCA doesn't capture it very well. You can actually take a neural network and use it to implement PCA. Okay, so this is usually people are used to doing sort of eigen decompositions, right, to, to find principal components. But there's an alternative approach which says we're going to train a special type of neural network that takes a data example as a vector, as input. It produces some code or hidden units, okay? And then we take that and we try to produce an output. But the output has the same number of dimensions as the input. And the output is trained to perfectly reconstruct the input. Okay, so typically what's done here, just like in PCA, is the representation is lower dimensional than the input. 
So maybe we take something that's 100 dimensions, we map it to eight dimensions, and then we map it back to something that's 100 dimensions. Okay, and so the, if the hidden and the output layers are linear, and the type of objective that we use on this network is the squared error between the output and the input, and we just use backpropagation like we talked about before, this will, this will basically do PCA. Okay? However, it won't exactly find the, the, the same basis vectors. They'll be kind of skewed and rotated a bit. And it will tend to not have um, differing uh, uh, levels of variance on the vectors. They'll, sort of, they'll all be essentially equal variance. Okay? But essentially, these basis vectors that are represented by these hidden units or features in this code are representing or spanning the same subspace as the principal components. Okay? So this is a neural network implementing PCA. Why would we do this when we have very efficient spectral methods? Um, the reason why we would do this and train this model by gradient descent when we could just do an eigen decomposition is that we can generalize this approach to nonlinear forms of PCA. Okay, so what we can do is instead of just doing a mapping from X through a weight matrix to a code, we can put a bunch of stuff in here and call it an encoder. When I say a bunch of stuff, I mean multiple layers. Okay, so we can stick a bunch of layers and nonlinearities in here, and we can also stick a bunch of layers and nonlinearities between the code and the reconstruction. And if we train that model using backpropagation, we get a nonlinear form of PCA. Okay, and this is capable of fitting data that doesn't lie on a linear subspace, a linear manifold. Okay? So um, these encoders and decoders, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how they get defined. Um, and this type of model is, is what's called an autoencoder because it's essentially a model that encodes uh, the input and tries to reconstruct the exact same thing. So um, the one key point of an autoencoder is that this bottleneck is extremely important. So the fact that we have a lower dimensional code than the input that is crucial for learning an interesting representation. If we had a code that was higher dimensional than the input, these weights or this network right here could just take the input, copy it okay, to this higher dimensional thing, and then just copy it back and perfectly reconstruct it. Okay? So it could get zero error and do something very stupid. All the representation would do would just be copy the thing. So that's typically why we use a bottleneck. If we want to learn a code layer that has more units or more dimensions than the original input, we have to use some form of regularization. Okay, so we're going to talk about a, diff a few different types of regularization techniques that lead to very interesting types of autoencoders. Okay, but this is the basic autoencoder. You've seen some of this math before. Um, essentially, your hidden representation or your code, if you're just using a single layer, is just uh, this is, you know, uh, expressing the, the matrix multiply kind of explicitly here, but it's just basically a linear transformation of the data pushed through a nonlinearity, just like we saw before in a standard neural network. Then to decode it, we have another linear transformation. Um, and then we produce an output, which is a function of the hidden representation. And the error typically is a squared error reconstruction, but if you have binary data, you can use a cross-entropy error, or if you have discrete data, you could use a uh, sort of a, um, a multivariate uh, cross entropy error, so forth. Okay, so that's the basic autoencoder. Regularized autoencoders allow you to learn a higher dimensional code layer, but they want to make the encoder or decoder simple in some way. So simple can have different meanings, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but basically, you have this kind of predictive opposition between the reconstruction objective, so that's trying to reconstruct the input with very high fidelity, it's trying to get back the input exactly, um, but then you also have this regularizer which is kind of making this weak, the decoder or the encoder weak, okay, or simple. So let's talk about what, what making it weak or, or making it simple really means. One idea is to just make it compact, like we talked about before, having a bottleneck layer. One idea is to um, reconstruct the input, but make the encoding sparse. Okay, so a lot of people use sparsity uh, in neural networks. These are sparse autoencoders. Another idea is to actually take the input and corrupt it before, learning f uh, 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 before mapping it to the code layer. If you corrupt the input with some noise, 
you can't copy it, right? Because if you just copied it, you would be copying back the corrupted thing, so you wouldn't get a good reconstruction. So that's called a denoising autoencoder. We corrupt the data, we map it to some uh, code layer, and then we map it back and try to reconstruct it perfectly. Finally, um, we can reconstruct the input from the code, but force the code to be insensitive to changes in the input. So we basically are going to be penalizing the derivatives of the code with respect to in the input. And if we do that, we have a model called a uh, contractive autoencoder. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more in detail about some of these models. So, sparse autoencoders. They have an additional term in the likelihood function, or the loss function, which is a regularizer. So this is your typical loss. So we said before this could be squared error between the input and the reconstructed input, the mapping the input through the network to reconstruct it. This regularizer term is essentially penalizing some estimate of the mean activation of the units in the code with some target activation. So the target activation is rho. That's typically uh, chosen to be something very small, like um, we only want the uh, average activation to be 0.1, or the, the units are only used 10% of the time, or even smaller than that. Okay, so the sparse autoencoder tries to reconstruct as best it can, but only a few of its uh, code units can be on any, for any particular presentation of the input. So that's a sparse autoencoder. There's a convolutional variant of it uh, by Karai Kavakalu called predictive sparse decomposition. And that's a good way of doing pre-training of convolutional nets using unsupervised learning. The denoising autoencoder, the way it works, is that we use just the usual loss function. Okay, so we're still taking an input, we're passing it through the network and producing a reconstruction, and we're measuring the loss, for example, the squared error, between the input and the reconstruction. However, when we get the input, we corrupt it. If it's a real valued input, typically we use something like Gaussian uh, noise, independent on each dimension. Okay, so by corrupting the input, even if the codes were very high dimensional and we just copied it to the code, like I said before, we would be copying the noisy thing, so we wouldn't be able to just copy it to the reconstruction. So the network is forced to denoise this input. Um, and this is why it's called a denoising autoencoder. And this has been shown to be a very good compressor for um, inputs. The last model I talked about in terms of regularized autoencoders is called a contractive autoencoder. Okay, so it has an objective function again with a loss function measuring fidelity between the input and the reconstruction, but it has a penalty with a, a, essentially a coefficient which controls the strength of the regularization, which penalizes the responses of the hiddens with respect to the inputs. Okay, so what this says, you know, reconstruct the best you can. This says the hiddens really shouldn't change as a function of the input. So these things kind of fight each other, and what ends up happening is that in directions along the data manifold, the hiddens are responsive, or they end up changing, because they have to be able to reconstruct um, the inputs. But in the directions that are orthogonal to the manifold, the hiddens are very flat, okay? So it actually contracts the, the input. So um, typically, again, we're just implementing these using sigmoids, or 10H, or, or relos, or whatever. Um, we have simple mappings of um, uh, input to hiddens, and hiddens to outputs. The interesting thing about these models too is, um, and this has only been discovered in recent years, is you can, dis you can train an autoencoder on some uh, data using this reconstruction-like objective plus a regularizer, and then after you've trained this model, even though it's not trained probabilistically, you can actually sample from autoencoders and generate reasonably good samples. Um, so that was something that was um, essentially a nice property of restricted Boltzmann machines. You could sample from them, they're a probabilistic model, but actually there's ways to now sample from autoencoders. And often um, the sampling process is like uh, the denoising process of adding noise, reconstructing, adding noise, reconstructing, and so forth. Okay, so um, for those of you who like theory a little bit, um, I just want to point some, point you to some resources uh, and, and, and papers that have been published in the last year or two uh, from the Montreal group that have really shed some insight on in terms of what's going on inside autoencoders. So this work is actually related mathematically the reconstruction objectives, so the difference between the reconstruction and the input to the score, all right, which is the derivative of the log density of the input. So this relates autoencoders, which are a deterministic model, 
to a probabilistic model. Okay, so it's actually the autoencoder is can be thought of like a density model, even though it's not trained probabilistically. Um, it's capturing the derivative of a log density of the data generating distribution, and it's actually capturing the curvature as well. So you can relate the reconstruction error to the curvature and other properties. Um, that's all I'm really going to say about that, but if you're interested in really what these autoencoders are capturing about the input, you can uh, look at these um, results by Alan and Bengio, which sort of which, which proved some of these relationships for very specific types of regularized autoencoders. And then a more recent paper by Bengio uh, and colleagues went and generalized this to a, a wide class of autoencoders. Okay, so that's autoencoders. Um, using a reconstruction-based object objective and using different forms of regularization to produce different types of autoencoders. The other popular method as a building block for deep learning uh, that's trained in an unsupervised manner is something called a restricted Boltzmann machine. And the restricted Boltzmann machine is based on, it's a simplified version of a, a model that was proposed earlier called the Boltzmann machine. So actually Boltzmann machines were known about even really before uh, backpropagation became very popular. Um, it's a neural network type model, but it's called a symmetrically connected model, meaning that you don't have a feed forward mapping from inputs or visible units to hiddens like we did in standard feed forward neural networks. We actually have these types of units needing to be in agreement with one another, okay? So these models, they're again trained unsupervised. We have there's actually can be a, a distribution associated with them, and we can sample from that distribution doing Gibbs sampling. Now the the downside of Boltzmann machines um, and also their power is in this full connectivity. So all of the connect the, all of the hidden units are connected to one another. All of the visible units are connected to one another, and there's dense connections between the hidden units and the visible units. However, because each of the units are dependent on each of the other units, the only way we can get a sample or agree on a particular state in this model is to do some form of MCMC, okay, which tends to be iterative and, and, and very slow. Uh, so both inference in this model and as a result, learning in this model is impractical. Okay? So there's various relaxations of, of Boltzmann machines that have been pros, proposed a long time ago, um, but typically, uh, these models are quite unwieldy to work with. Okay, so specifically, you know, what's going on in this model in a, in a mathematical sense is to get, um, I should also note, note that these are binary models, okay? So typically, all of the, the hidden units are binary and, and stochastic binary, and the visible units are also binary. So for a particular hidden unit to update its state, based on all the other units. So it has to decide on whether it's going to be active or not, or if it's going to be a one or a zero. So to do that, it computes a probability of being one, and that's given uh, the visible units and all of the other uh, hidden units. And it computes something called an energy gap. Okay? And it's essentially the difference in the energy between that unit being on, given everything else, and that unit being off. Okay? So this is called an energy-based model, and there's, it has an energy function, and units can have to go you know, sort of one at a time iteratively and compute their energy gaps, um, compute this probability as a function of the energy gap, and then make a stochastic selection of whether they turn on or not. Restricted Boltzmann machines make a simple but important architectural change to the model. They don't connect the hiddens to each other, and they don't connect the visibles to each other. Okay? What that means is that given a series of visible units or a vector of observations, you can compute each of the hidden units in parallel. Okay, because a, a hidden unit doesn't need to talk to other hidden units to determine its state. All it needs to know is the information coming from the visible units. And vice versa, a, a given visible unit to update its state, given the hidden units, needs to know about all the other hidden units, but doesn't need to know about the visible units because it's not connected to them. Okay? So the um, hidden units and the visible units can be updated in a single step. So essentially, it ends up being, uh, due to the energy function of this model, essentially uh, uh, taking the inputs, so, so to compute the probability that a particular hidden unit, J, is on, given the inputs, it pushes through a sigmoid function, 
essentially a linear mapping of the inputs. Okay, so it's just the same operation that's being done in a standard feedforward network. We apply some weight matrix to the input, we add a bias for a unit, and we push that through a sigmoid. And that gives us a number between 0 and 1, and that's the probability of a particular hidden unit being on. Okay? So we can very quickly uh, get the probability in parallel of each of these hidden units. Um, so when we learn in a restricted Boltzmann machine, it turns out that if we take the derivative of the log probability of, a, of an RBM with respect to the weights, we get a very simple expression, which is essentially some statistics about the correlations of the visible units and the hidden units, okay, of a per, the, the units connected to a particular weight. Remember, there's only weights between hit, visible units I and hidden units J. So for a particular weight, we need to know essentially the average or expected <laughs> correlations of those units, when, whether they're on together or off together, while being driven by the data, okay, so when the data is clamped to an input vector, versus their statistics or their correlations when the model is just freely running, so while it's doing Gibbs sampling, while it's updating its units and sort of fantasizing. Um, so that's exactly what I just said. Um, and so once we can compute this difference in statistics or correlations, then this will give us an expression for the gradient, okay? And that is, uh, and, and the weight update for a given weight in RBM is proportional to that gradient, okay? Now, this thing is easy to, to get because we clamp our data and we can go and update all of our hidden units um, in parallel. This second term here is a little bit more complicated because we still have to do Gibbs sampling. We still need, we have our, we have our uh, this is essentially a, a uh, an example from the model. So the, the data is no longer, longer clamped. So the model is in this stage where it's just sort of generating data or generating, generating fantasy data or it's dreaming. Okay, so the learning algorithm for a restricted Boltzmann machine looks something like this. We take some data, okay, this is a vector from our training data set. We present it to the network. We go up and we infer the hidden units uh, in parallel with one another using that expression using the sigmoid times the um, affine mapping and or uh, the sigmoid of the affine mapping and then we measure the correlations between each hidden unit and each visible unit that becomes the first term in our gradient then we go on and we reconstruct the data we use this basically the same expression that we use for the hidden units to get a reconstruction. So given the hidden units, we can update each of the visible units in parallel. And then we go up one more time, and then we compute the, uh, we infer the hidden units given the visible units. And we keep doing this, okay? So we, if we do this to infinity, this will give us a sample from the model, okay? So we've run the, the chain to, to, this Markov chain to thermal equilibrium, and we now have a fantasy visible observation and a fantasy hidden observation. And this, uh, the statistics here, the correlation here, once we've run this chain to infinity, is the second term in our gradient. So the model term is just running this uh, Gibbs sampler to infinity, and the data term is just the, sort of the first step of, of uh, running this Gibbs sampler. So this, um, you know, we're running a Gibbs sampler to infinity, all right? So this is something that would take a long time to do to update the model. So there's a simple trick, and it's called contrasted divergence. And contrasted divergence just says, why don't we just take the data, map it to the hiddens, measure the correlations, reconstruct it, and then go up one more time and just stop there. And instead of using the fantasy data and the fantasy hiddens, after running this chain to thermal equilibrium, why don't we just use the one-step reconstruction of the data and the one-step update of the hiddens? And that's what we use for weight updates. So CD, this is called CD1, where you just do a one-step up and down and up. You can also do what's called CDK, where just you run the chain for a, fix, a small fixed number of steps, like five or 10, or this may be also adjusted during learning. And so this is basically the simplest learning algorithm uh, was published in about 2002, and this got people starting to use RBMs, and this started the idea of pre-training deep neural networks and got people excited um, about deep learning. Now, just for in terms of an, an intuition or a picture of what's happening in contrasted divergence learning, 
you have some energy function, right, which is, which is basically um, an unnormalized log probability of this model, which is basically determining uh, whether uh, joint configurations of the, the visibles and the hiddens are pleasing to the model. Okay, so we want to get towards low energy states for uh, data examples. Okay, we want conf confabulations or fantasies from the model when our weights are, in, uh, in, um, are, are unlearned to be basically having high energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a data point, all right, and the first term in that gradient pushes down on the energy of that data point. The second term pushes up on the energy of the reconstruction. So after we've done one step of CD, our energy surface goes from this to this sort of thing. So basically the energy has become lower at the data point and higher at the reconstruction of the model. Okay? So we can think of the model taking in data, interpreting it or reconstructing it, and us pulling up on the energy and saying, you know, that's not what we wanted, we wanted the real data. Okay? And so that's, we do this a number of times and we end up getting a, a complicated, very complicated uh, energy function um, that when normalized can be interpreted as a probabilistic model. Okay, so I told you about the very simplest learning algorithm for uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, the contrasted divergence. There are a number of people who are looking at alternatives. Okay, so CD1 actually doesn't learn you very good generative models. If you generate samples from an RBM that's been trained with CD, they look pretty crummy. Okay, so like I said before, running CD for more steps, like five or 10 or 25 or so forth, um, this is called a CDK, that works better. What's even better to do is don't reset your Markov chain at the data for every point. Okay, so you maintain sort of this persistent chain and you run your, your CD as usual. This is called persistent CD. This has been around for a few years and this would be what I would recommend is sort of the first step if you're going to sort of foray into the world of RBMs. Uh, any of the tutorials you'll see on RBMs will probably give you uh, an overview of how to use persistent CD. This is a good entry point. There's other more complicated methods of tra uh, training CD, uh, uh, training RBMs as an alternative to CD, including score matching. Um, there's something called minimum probability flow, which was presented a couple years ago. And there's a paper here um, by some researchers at UBC who go through and really uh, empirically investigate each of these different training methods for RBMs. The point here is that there's different uh, learning algorithms for this RBM architecture. But a good starting point and something that works reasonably well and is simple is persistent CD. Okay, so where we are now is we've talked about two building blocks. I mean, there's a lot of other types of building blocks that can be built into deep learning types of architectures. However, we're sort of, we have limited time today, so I've presented the most popular ones. Now I'm going to move on to taking these building blocks and stacking them into deeper models. All right. So I've said before, you know, we can use autoencoders. We can even use forms of k-means, which have been shown to actually work pretty well in practice. Or independent component analysis can also be stacked into deep architectures. So let's go on um, and talk about that. All right. So let's start with RBMs because that was sort of the the where stacking started. So the idea is we take an RBM. We have unlabeled data, right? We just have a series of input vectors X, and we train an RBM on this data, say using persistent CD, okay? Once we've done several passes of the data, we have learned a generative model of this data. Um, we have some weights that are fit, and for any input we, we can present to the model, we can easily infer a code or a feature representation of that data. And remember, for RBMs, these are typically binary. There's many different types of extensions for uh, types of inputs. So we could have real valued inputs, um, we could have binary inputs, we could have discrete inputs. These are used for modeling words, um, documents, and so forth. Um, but typically in RBMs, the feature representation is binary. Okay, so we take an input, we produce a binary representation. If we take every single input in our training data set, set and map it to its hidden representation, that will generate a, essentially a new data set, right? It's a data set built up of the feature representations. So we can just take that and um, train another RBM on top of it, okay? So this RBM extracts features from features. If we stick these two models together by composing them, we get a model called a deep belief network, which is essentially a hybrid 
a generative discriminative or a, sorry a hybrid directed undirected model it has undirected connections at the top where we need to essentially do some sort of Gibbs sampling to settle on a state and then go from this first layer of hidden units to through a, a, a single mapping to the first stage of to get a, a data a sample from this model so this is the deep belief networks um, essentially when we do inference in a deep belief network, we use a separate set of inference connections. So these uh, red connections here, if you're familiar with generative models, these red connections are not part of the generative model. The generative model is just the green connections. Do some sampling in these layers and then go down and then down. Okay, that generates a sample from the model. However, to generate representations from data, we have to use these red connections to go upwards. Um, so. What's the point of stacking RBMs and, and what's sort of the intuition behind it? There's a number of distributions that are uh, learned implicitly by RBMs. So there's obviously there's the joint distribution, which is exponentiating and normalizing the energy function. So this is a joint over visible and hidden configurations. There's the conditional. So the distribution on the visibles given the hiddens. There's the conditional of the hiddens given the visibles. And there's also marginal distributions. If we take the joint distribution learned by an RBM and marginalize it over the hidden configurations, we can view the RBM as modeling a conditional distribution of given the hiddens, produce me a visible vector, and a prior distribution over the hiddens or a marginal distribution over the hiddens. When we stack, we can think of this as leaving this distribution as is, so maintaining this conditional and improving the distribution over the hiddens. So we throw away this prior of the hiddens and we produce it, we replace it with another network. So if we are able to make this new model better at modeling the hiddens than the original the implicit distribution captured by the, the, the weights that were originally learned, then we'll get a better generative model. So that's the idea behind stacking. It's, you know, you look at this model, um, you've, oops, You've learned some distribution over the visibles and learned the marginal distribution over the hiddens. You're going to throw that away and just train another model on top of the hiddens. So that produces a better P of H. And that's captured by that second RBM that you learned. And then those things are hooked together into a, 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 more, a, a more improved generative model. OK, so there's also another model that often gets confused with deep belief networks. It's something called a deep Boltzmann machine. And this model, DBM, is a totally undirected network. So I told you before that the DBM was a sort of hybrid, uh, undirected, directed network. The DBM is a totally undirected network. And to generate samples from this model, you have to do MCMC in this whole, this whole architecture. So it's a, it's a more uh, complicated model for generating samples. But it's a much more powerful architecture because it incorporates feedback. So in terms of... Um, when you take data in a DBN and infer the uh, features of that data, you just do a single pass. There's no feedback connections. But when you infer the feature representations in a DBM, you actually have communication between the different layers of the model. So to get an H2 representation in this model, it has to consider what's going on at H3, and it has to consider what's going on at H1. Okay, so we'd actually like to add feedback to the DBN, but the way that this model is designed, it can incorporate feedback connections. Giving this model feedback connections or undirected weights everywhere, um, make it a more powerful model, but make it much more difficult to train. So the typical approach to training a deep Boltzmann machine is similar to a DBN. We take um, an RBM and we train it greedily, meaning we train it one layer at a time. So we train the RBM on some data. We take that RBM, we map all the data through the model to get a, a data set of feature representations, and then we generate, a, we, we learn a second RBM on top of that data, and then we wire them together. Note here that we've actually also learned another unit connected to the second RBM, which is going to represent a label. Okay, so our end goal here is to do supervised learning, but we're going to be pre-training using unsupervised learning. So this unit up here is a label, and that's been learned when we learn the second RBM. So we've wired this guy, these two RBMs up together, and then we're going to then train the whole thing with a variational approximation to log likelihood. So we're going to do generative training 
okay, of the whole model. So we're modeling the probability, joint probability of the data and the label. So you can see this is P of X and Y. We're maximizing that log likelihood. Then what we do when we train a deep Boltzmann machine is we throw away that top layer and we just do supervised training and relearn these top layer weights as if this thing was an MLP, as if we just took input, mapped it through several layers, and got to an output. Okay? So what you see, what you're probably thinking here is this seems like a really confusing and crazy approach to training this model. We've essentially done um, L plus, plus 2, which is the number of steps. We've trained L plus 2 mod number of layers. So if we have L layers in this model, we've learned L plus 2 different models using L plus 2 objectives. Right? So we're often taking these models, training them with different objectives, and wiring them together. It's a really complicated and kind of horrendous process. So the question is, can we just jointly learn all of these weights together and train a, a sim single homogeneous deep belief network? So there's a paper from last year um, from Ian Goodfellow and colleagues of the University of Montreal, which has actually proposed a technique for training this deep unsupervised model um, homogeneously, or all of the layers together. There's a number of reasons why we might want to do this. One of them is that if we're training the model greedily, it means that the uh, lower layers that we train, they never get updated once we learn higher level features. So they don't learn to be compatible with any higher level abstractions. We're just training the layers, then sticking another layer on top of it, and then sticking a layer on top of it. So the layers don't learn to really communicate with one another. Um, if we train a single model for all tasks, meaning um, filling in inputs, filling in labels, we can just use generic infer inference for making arbitrary queries about those inputs and outputs. And then, as I said in the last, uh, in, in, just a minute ago, m implementing multiple models and different stages of trainings make these models very cumbersome and nasty to work with. So, in a multi-prediction DBM, the um, approach is um, relatively simple, and um, what you do is you take a mini batch of data. So this, these rows here in this picture are different cases in a mini batch. And not only do you select random cases to train from, you actually select random elements to fill in. Okay, So when I show you um, black here, that means that's data that's given to you. So in this case, we've been given some elements of the input and the output. In this case, we've been given some elements, different elements of the input, and we haven't been given the outputs. So when we're, the blue means that we're trying to fill that in. So the model is actually trained to fill in some of the inputs or the outputs from the other ones um, that were given to it. Okay? So this DBM essentially predicts, is trained to predict any subset of its variables in the input layer or the output layer from any other subset. And this allows this model to train all layers together. Okay, so the last part of this um, unsupervised learning talk is I'm going to extend this into modeling sequences. So we talked before about taking a neural network and extending this into a model of time series through the use of a recurrent neural network. I'm going to take the restricted Bolson machine and I'm going to transform that into a time series model by adding additional connections from the past. Okay, so the idea here is that we have a standard RBM with visibles and hiddens, and now we're going to add a history. So this is a collection of the visibles at previous time steps. And I'm just going to introduce a, a new set of weights that go to the hidden units and a new set of weights that go to the visibles. And by using the RBM as sort of the building block of this model, it means that inference and sampling is still easy, just as it is in an RBM. The idea is just to treat the visible variables at the previous time step as fixed inputs. Okay, so all it means really is, in, in terms of training, is when we infer these hiddens, we have some additional input coming in, and when we reconstruct these visibles, we have some additional input coming in. This model is called a conditional restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay, so just sort of one step at a time, we take an RBM, has some visible units, and it has some hidden units, we add two types of directed connections, so we have connections between the recent time steps. Typically, we'll use anywhere between three to 10 time steps. Those get wired up um, into the visible layer. If we didn't have hidden units here, this would just be an autoregressive, a linear autoregressive model, which some of you might be familiar with. However, we also add connections between the past 
to the current hidden layer. Okay? So the history can basically allow us to model sort of short-term linear structure that's picked up by the autoregressive connections, and the history can also influence the dynamics of the model through the hidden layer. The cool thing about this is that conditioning is not going to change the inference or the learning procedure. Okay, so we looked at CD for a standard RBM. Let's look at CD for a conditional restricted Boltzmann machine. Again, we take some data, and when we compute the hidden units, we have some bias coming in from the history. Okay, so that's just thought it can be thought of as a dynamically changing bias. When we do the reconstruction through those autoregressive connections, we also have some additional input coming in to those visible units when we do the reconstruction. Then we go back up and do the um, infer the hidden units, and we again have a dynamic bias entering those hidden units. And so that's our sort of one step CD. It's not a whole lot different than doing CD with an RBM. You can then take a, a CRBM, and just like an RBM being stacked into a deep belief network, you can stack a CRBM into a, a, a deep conditional RBM. Okay, so this is a conditional deep belief network. Um, the model can, just like an RBM, can be fine-tuned generatively or discriminatively. So what I'm showing you here is some of the work that I did when I was at University of Toronto, and this is a conditional restricted bolts machine that's been trained on motion capture data. Okay, so we train this on 10 styles of walking. Uh, this, I believe, is the uh, chicken walk. Okay, so it's a, some human pretending they're a chicken. Um, we've learned the model on these 10 different styles of data. And by initializing with a few frames of any particular style, the model will go on and generate that type of motion. So this is the dinosaur walk. Um, it's a nonlinear model, uh, so it can do very kind of... Um, non-sequential uh, motion. This is the drunk one, which you might notice. Uh, sort of stumbling around, right? So it's, 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 it's not just a, sort of a repeated motion, it's actually uh, learned to emulate these styles quite well. Um, when we train these models, this is a few years ago, it took about one hour to train them on a modern workstation, and it's actually faster than that with a GPU. So we're generating at 30 frames per second, so essentially the generation is real time at that frame rate. Um, that's the elegant lady walking, okay? So this is a, this is a two-layer conditional deep belief network um, that actually generates pretty realistic looking motion. So you could skin this up to a character and have them uh, you know, walk around uh, for an animation, or you could actually uh, control a robot using this generative model. Um, now, what we might want to do is model context, okay? So the idea here is that we were able to get these different styles of generation by initializing the motion with a few frames of that particular style. But there was no way to, to be able to tell the model to change styles or prevent the model from sort of changing styles on its own. Okay, so what we'd like to do is introduce some context in terms of what style. There's no style variable in the model, style variable in the model we just looked at. We like to incorporate style into that model. So um, the idea here is that we could just provide a style label at the very top of the hidden layer. And this is what's been done for RBMs when we want to train a generative model and it adds some additional label information. For example, if we're doing recognition, we might want to add a class label. So we could just add a style label up here. Um, and we can see in sort of a, a, a typical deep belief network, style can get added up here and that can influence the top layer hidden, hidden units. The problem is if we did this with this uh, conditional deep belief network by adding a label of a style label up here, is it doesn't really control the dynamics, right? We have the dynamics being influenced by all these connections coming from the history to these feature representations, and this style label is not interacting with them. Okay, so it's just it's a very weak way of introducing style information into this model. So there's a different way we can go about this, and that's through something called a multiplicative interaction. And so we've been talking about weights that connect a visible unit to a hidden unit. But there's no reason why we can't have third order relationships in weights, okay? So instead of having a weight matrix, we could have a weight tensor, which represents the interaction between three variables, okay? So essentially this amounts to letting variables sort of multiply other variables and use their products in the computation. Um, and this type of model has been used to learn transformations between images and actually do time series modeling. Um, but we are going to use this model to actually introduce style information into the network. 
So um, there's a tutorial on these. This is a whole different branch of um, representation learning methods. Um, and Roland Mesevich is one of the um, key people um, working at the University of Montreal on these sorts of multiplicative models. He has a very nice tutorial on these methods. So there's two views of what's going on here. Okay. So when we introduce these third order connections, we can either think of this as an input output model, an in, sorry, an input output model. Okay. So we have some variables that are input variables and output variables. So one way to think about this is if you had like a time series model. You have some history and you want to predict the future. And then you have a series of hidden units which are modulating or changing the weights in that simple time series model. So this is an autoregressive model. These hidden units can be thought of just blending in different sets of weights for that autoregressive model. That's one view. The other equivalent view is the RBM-like view. So you have some visible or output variables, you have some hidden variables, and then you have this additional input. And that additional input is just changing the weights of the RBM. So for every setting of the input, that defines a new set of weights in an RBM. And it's that view that kind of lets us see that it's easy to train these sorts of models. If we're given the input, then it just sets the weights in this model, conditional on the input, and then we can just train it like a standard RBM using contrastive divergence or another me mechanism. Okay, so in our, in our case, we're going to use these variables to represent style information. So we're going to have a discrete encoding of style, whether this is you know, dinosaur or chicken or old man or drunk or whatever. We're going to represent this, and then we're going to let those style variables change the dynamics that are influenced by the weights of the network. Okay, so the contextual variables are basically gating every set of weights. So I'm showing you a single weight between a style variable, a hidden variable, and a visible variable, but we have one of these weights or connections for every single triplet of these variables in our system. Okay, so basically we can think of these style variables as blending in a new network and really um, we can share parameters across styles and we don't really need to change in the inference or the learning algorithm. Okay, so this is what the network looks like. We take um, a standard CRBM, okay, that's the CRBM model over here. So we got, remember, weights between the past and the present, weights between the past and the hidden, and then we have these undirected connections between the visible and the hidden layer. If we add in style, okay, we can take a discrete encoding of style and map this to a series of real valued features which allows it to capture commonalities of the style. So maybe you know, dinosaur and chicken have some commonality or elegant woman and, and probably not drunk, but maybe, <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, dinosaur or something like that have some relationship between them. That gets captured in some real valued features that are derived from style. And it's those features that interact in this multiple, uh, multiplicative interaction with all of the three subnetworks. So the connections, the red connections that were between the hiddens and the visibles, those red connections are now gated or modulated by the features. The blue connections, the autoregressive connections, those get gated by the features. And finally, the green connections, past to hidden, those also get modulated. Okay, so the features or the style is influencing all of those weights dynamically in the model. Now, there is a bit of a problem here. We've gone from three sets of weight matrices, the red, the green, and the blue matrices, to a weight tensor for each of these subnetworks. Okay, so we've gone from sort of a, a quadratic parameterization to a cubic one. So we've massively blown up the number of parameters. Um, and we don't want to have to learn all these parameters because we need a lot more data to train them. And it's also be a lot, it would be a lot slower to train such a model. But there's a simple way to get around this. And that's the idea of factoring. Okay, so the, the idea of factoring, I'm just showing one subnetwork right now, but this is applied to all of the subnetworks. So we take this weight tensor, which connects features, style features, to hiddens, to outputs, and this weight tensor, each element can be thought of as a multiplication of an element in a matrix from style to factors, from hidden to factors, and from outputs to factors. So we're replacing this tensor with three low rank matrices. 
Okay? So what this amounts to doing is when we, we, we pick a particular visible eye, hidden J, and style feature L, we're selecting essentially rows or columns of these matrices, we're taking their element-wise products, and we're summing over them. Okay? So that allows us to move from a cubic parameterization to a quadratic parameterization. Okay, so we've, re we've replaced these tensors with matrices. Um, we do this in each of the subnetworks. Okay, so we have, remember, these tensors, which implement these three-way features. We replace each of those tensors with weight matrices. Now we have actually nine weight matrices. So, we, for example, we have this one here uh, going from the output to factors. We have one from features to factors, and we have one from inputs to factors. And then we have hiddens to factors, inputs to factors, and features to factors, and so on. So we have, eight, we have nine different weight matrices. However, um, we can actually share the ones that are compatible in sizes. So what I'm using here, uh, I'm showing dots where, there, where each of these weight matrices are on the left. And over here, I'm showing a tying of these guys over here, represented by a single dot. So we can take these nine weight matrices and reduce these to four of them that are shared. Okay, so again, that does a further reduction in parameters of this model. So, now that we've incorporated style features into this model, we don't have to just initialize with a particular style. We initialize with a particular style, and we set a particular style variable. So we can say, oh, I want to generate dinosaur motion, or I want to generate sexy motion. So this is the sexy walk, okay? And you're going to see when we suddenly changed that over to the dinosaur walk. Okay, see so it did a blending. So there was no data in the database. Um, this is, uh, again, sexy. I'm trying to remember which one this is. I'll see. Use, That's to regular. So sexy. Use, uh, okay, so there's a question of the input representations. Uh -huh. So the input representation for this data set are joint angles. Okay, so some joints will have three degrees of freedom, some joints will have two de degrees of freedom. Uh, and they came to us originally in an Euler representation, and then we converted them into exponential maps, okay, which is a different representation of those angles. And then there's also a root position and a root orientation. Um, so there's 49 variables, it's 49 dimensional for each time step. Okay, so we're synthesizing those 49 variables and then and visualizing it. So anyways, um, inserting these style variables allows us to transition from one style to another. It also allows us to clamp multiple variables. So you can go up here and put on both um, sort of half strong and half dinosaur, and that would give you something like a strong dinosaur. So it can actually blend styles that weren't in the original data set. And again, synthesis is still in, in real time. Um, this is just really small because it's a very long walk, and you'll see that it sort of traverses ac across the whole field, and we switch styles several times, going from, um, I think this one's like elegant woman to regular or something like that. Okay. Um, we did, there's more details in, in, in the papers that we published on this, but we did do a quantitative evaluation of some of these techniques, and it turns out that actually the factoring approach and integrating style information gives you better accuracy in terms of predicting the future. So it's very difficult to evaluate generative models. We could have people look at the quality of the animation and give their subjective opinion on how good that is. But another thing that we can do is we can try to predict the future. So we have a motion capture sequence. We see how for forward in time we want to predict. So in this case, we predict 5 frames forward or 10 frames forward or 15 frames forward. And then we measure the root mean squared prediction error for these various techniques. And we basically see that you know, an autoregressive model with no hidden variables does the worst. Introducing hidden variables is better for prediction. And actually um, doing style and, uh, introducing style variables, so it's essentially a supervised problem, um, and uh, doing forward prediction with this factored conditional RBM variant does a better job in terms of prediction. Um, so that's basically it for this part of the talk. So uh, I've just to sort of review what we've talked about, uh, we talked about supervised deep learning techniques, which have been the most pop popular, but we also spent some time on talking about unsupervised methods for doing feature extraction, feature learning. And we talked about taking these feature learning techniques and building them into uh, deeper networks.
Uh, and I also talked about different temporal extensions to these models. Okay, so we talked about recurrent neural networks, which extended normal neural networks. We talked a very briefly about 3D convolutional networks, and we talked about the conditional restricted Boltzmann machine, which extends the restricted Boltzmann machine to modeling sequences. So um, a couple of sort of areas of focus would be extending some of these supervised learning methods from one layer into multi-layer techniques. So um, the multi-prediction deep Boltzmann machine was one, uh, uh, one example of that, but there's many to be discovered. Um, and then I didn't really talk too much about structured output. So this is things like doing segmentation or multi-attribute prediction. These are all um, very tough problems, and I think uh, you'll see deep learning attacking these in the next few years. So with that, I thank you very much for your information, or for your attention. Um, I guess I gave you some information. And just to show you where Guelph is, it's, it's quite close to Toronto. Uh, and we're very sort of close to this deep learning triangle, right? Montreal, New York, Toronto. And we have close collaborations with all these labs. So for students, um, I want to encourage you to consider opportunities in Canada. And uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to one funding agency uh, in Canada called um, MyTax, which provides uh, internships. Specifically, they target students in Mex Mexico. So this, um, if you're looking for internships abroad to come to Canada, uh, they'll basically put you up, pay for your accommodations, uh, pay for your flight. They'll find you a, a good match in terms of research interests. And I've hosted students from um, India and China, but not yet from Mexico. So just wanted to point that out. Thanks a lot, and I'd be happy to take questions.